before I start anything, I want to ask you guys a couple of questions. Okay. Um, if there was a pill that was good for your heart, your bones, your memory, your kidneys, your mood, um, and your muscles, would you take that medicine? Would you take that pill? Probably like everybody here would take a pill if you know, there's something like that was working for it. Um, now what about if there was a type of food or a vitamin, um, you know, something that you can eat that was good for all of those same things, would you, would you eat that food? You know, most, most people probably would, um, right? Like, of course, like if there was something that was good for your heart, your, your kidneys, your lungs, your brain, your bones, it, it sounds like something that, you know, everybody wants and everybody would take 100% of the time. Um, well, there isn't a food, there isn't a pill, there isn't a vitamin, there isn't a supplement, there isn't an injection that can do all of that. But there is something that can do all of those things, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, exercise, specifically strength training, is the closest thing to a miracle drug that there is. So we're going to talk about all of the benefits of strength training and exercise um, besides getting stronger, besides feeling better, besides moving better. We're going to talk about the medical benefits of strength training and exercise. Um, that's, that's what I want to talk about today with all of you. Medicine is defined as the science or practice of the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease. Okay, so another definition of medicine is it can be any substance or substances that is used to treat diseases or illnesses. And another definition of medicine um, is the science or art of dealing with the maintenance of health and the prevention, alleviation, or cure of disease. So this is what medicine is. Medicine is defined as something that is used to diagnose, treat, or prevent disease. But a lot of times what we end up doing is we keep on thinking of medicine as just something that you can take, not something that you can do. Okay, so we can all do medicine and um, very plainly and very simply, exercise is medicine. All right, it, it can't get more clear of a definition than that. If, if medicine is something that is, you know, used to maintain, prevent, or cure disease, that's what exercise is. But right now, we're conditioned. Everybody thinks that medicine is something that somebody gives to you. You go to your doctor, you go to your pharmacist, you go, to, you know, to any place like that, and it'll give you a medicine. But we don't think that exercise and something that we can do, like yoga is a medicine, meditation is a medicine, um, exercise and strength training is also medicine. Um, and the, the amazing thing about what I do every day is I use exercise to help people manage their diseases and also cure their diseases. Um, so exercise is a proven way to treat, prevent um, many chronic conditions. So something that you might have had for 10, 20 years, exercise is a proven way to, like, to lower the severity of these chronic conditions maybe even prevent it from happening in the future. And the best thing is there's no side effects, right? When you're taking some medicines or pills, there might be some side effects you're, you're not really hoping to get. You can get dizziness, you can get stomach problems. All of these things are common side effects of medicine. But with strength training and exercise, there's no side effect. Um, sometimes people say, but you know, exercise sometimes hurts me. Sometimes my shoulders hurt, my knees my knees or my back hurt. Um, my answer to that is that's not a side effect. That means that you're taking the wrong medicine or exercise. If you're doing the wrong exercise, that's why your back is hurting or your knees are hurting. But if you're taking the right medicine or the right exercises, um, there should be no pain. It should feel great. You should feel energetic. You should feel happier. Uh, you should feel really confident about yourself. And that's, that's really the only side effect that I see of, you know, exercise as medicine. So we're going to talk a little bit now about the different um, parts of medicine or the different areas of your body that exercise is proven to help. Um, and then after this, I'm going to take you all through like a short 10 to 12 minute exercise routine just to show you like how it should feel when you're exercising. And that, that's the important thing here. Okay. So first thing for your bone density. So people that have osteoporosis or osteopenia, um, especially when you get older, um, more common in women, more common in Asian and white women. Um, but 
that's a very common thing and that can lead to many other medical complications as well. But high intensity strength training has a direct and positive relationship to bone mineral density. So, and they did that, if they did that with the combination, if like, if you take, if you do high intensity strength training and you take um, calcium supplements together, then that has an even better um, effect on your bone mineral density. And it has an added benefit of improving your balance, improving your strength, and improving your muscle mass compared to if you only take calcium or vitamin D supplements. So most commonly when people get osteoporosis diagnoses, you know, they get some injections every couple of months. Sometimes they're taking like a, like a vitamin D supplement, they're taking a calcium supplement, but they're not exercising with it. And that's the important thing because that combination is what really gives you the best results. And you can slow down the progression of osteoporosis. Um, or if you have osteopenia, you can prevent osteoporosis from happening. If you, if you start exercising early enough, um, your bone mineral density can stay strong and healthy the rest of your life. It doesn't have to develop into osteoporosis. Cognitive functioning, so your brain power. Um, that, that's, you know, a little bit unexpected, but strength training is helpful in preventing dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, or if you have dementia and Alzheimer's, it also improves the cognitive function in older adults. So it can also help you improve your memory and it also improves um, your focus and attention. Um, so this is an, a really important benefit of strength training. Um, and there's other types of exercise that also help um, your cognitive function like yoga, dance, Learning new things, learning new movements is a great way to make your brain really stimulated. And that's a great thing to do to prevent dementia, Alzheimer's from happening. And it's also a really important thing to do as you get older and older and older. Um, and it's fun, you know, it's fun to get social, fun to like get with a group of people and exercise together. You get to talk, you get to move around and that's great for your brain. Um, and it, like the crazy thing about exercise is it makes you smarter. It makes your memory better. Um, so if you're a student or if you know any students, they should also be exercising because that's going to help their memory get better so they can, they can perform better in school as well. Um, also, this is the, th like this next part um, that I'm going to talk about. It's something that I'm, I'm really passionate about because it's something that we don't talk about enough as a community, um, especially communities of color. Um, so mood, uh, depression, and anxiety are really big in a lot of communities, specifically um, minority communities, um, and a lot of times people are avoiding going to psychologists, um, avoid talking, going to therapy to talk about what's going on, um, and you know that that's something that we need to work on. Mental health is definitely something that is lacking in a lot of communities, specifically ours, from my experience. Um, but strength training and exercise can improve the, the symptoms of depression. It can improve the symptoms of anxiety disorder. And it is shown to uh, improve or increase the release of um, these chemicals called endorphins, which are basically responsible for making you feel happier, making you feel more energetic, um, making you feel like you know, you're in a, in a happier place. So exercise is directly shown to improve symptoms of, the, of depression and anxiety disorder. And that's something we need to talk about. Um, mental health is a place in medicine that is not necessarily, um, no, it, it's just not, it's not utilized enough. It's a, it's a place in medicine where it's definitely lacking people going to see their uh, mental health providers. Um, and people are more and more depressed and anxious these days. Exercise is a great way to work on that. Work on yourself, make you make yourself feel more confident, make yourself feel stronger, and make yourself feel in control. And these things all, in addition to like the chemical side of it, it also gives you a lot of um, psychological strength. It also gives you a lot of emotional strength as well. Um, okay, so those are like the, the some of like the unexpected benefits of um, strength training, but there's many more. Um, how many people here know somebody with heart disease um, or high blood pressure, uh, coronary artery disease? Everybody knows somebody. So specifically in my family, um, my, my dad has nine brothers and sisters. So he's one of 10. He's the middle child. Um, and out of his family, out of all of my aunts and uncles, seven of them had bypass surgeries already. 
Um, some like a couple of my uncles, they had it in their fifties. They had the bypass surgeries in their fifties. My dad, I think it was in his early sixties or late fifties that he had his bypass surgery. Um, and seven out of ten of us have heart disease. So I have a lot of cousins. I have like maybe I can't even count. It's too many cousins, but. One thing that we all need to do is we need to start taking care of our hearts now. So maybe 20, 30 years later, we don't have to have these bypass surgeries. We don't have to have these really big medical procedures and they're really scary and they're really risky. So strength training is actually proven to help to prevent, treat, and also reduce the severity of heart disease. Um, so basically if you have like these thickening of these arteries, if, you're, um, high, if your blood pressure is really high, doing strength training um, and exercise can help manage your blood pressure so it can lower your blood pressure to a safer level and it can also improve your activity tolerance so what that means is um, a really common time where people in new york get heart attacks is when it's snowing a lot they wake up in the morning they go out and start shoveling and it's a really shoveling is a really intense exercise it's, it makes a lot of the muscles in your arms work makes a lot of the muscles in your legs and your back and your core work but that's such a high level intensity exercise. Most people haven't conditioned their body to be able to do that. So when they do this, when they start shoveling, 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 it puts a lot of stress on their heart and they can have a heart attack. So exercise and strength training can condition your heart. So make your heart a little bit more used to doing these high intensity movements and it can prevent a heart attack from happening. Um, the other added benefit of exercise is you can notice things about yourself. So one thing that my mom told me um, recently, maybe like four or five months ago, when she was walking uphill, she started noticing, you know, she was getting short of breath. She didn't have any chest pain or anything, but she was getting more tired than she was expecting. Um, that's something you can only learn from exercise. If you're sitting all day, you know, just working on your computer all day and you're really just, you know, walking slowly every day, you don't notice how your heart is handling these higher level of activities. So what did my mom do? We told her to go to, to go to her primary care doctor. Her primary care doctor noticed something a little bit abnormal in her EKG. And then she was referred to a cardiologist. And you know, luckily we know a really good cardiologist in our family because of all of my dad's brothers and sisters who needed it. Um, so they did a stress test on my mom. They found a couple blockages. They, they found something, they found like abnormality in the EKG on the stress test, which means she was walking on a treadmill and they, they saw that her heart wasn't um, pumping the right way. It was the electrical activity was a little bit off. And then they sent her to get an angiogram and they saw a couple of blockages. So they caught it early enough. So she had stents put in. But if she waited five or 10 years and if she was never walking, never exercising, she never would have felt short of breath. So, you know, like exercise is great to treat, but it's also great to diagnose these things as well. And that's the important part. And luckily, um, my mom was able to get um, evaluated and seen early rather than having to get a bypass surgery 10 years later. So that's another really important benefit of um, strength training. It also helps you diagnose these things as well. Um, the other big thing in minority communities, especially um, people of color, um, diabetes. How many people here know somebody that has diabetes or pre-diabetes, right? So pre-diabetes is um, when your A1C is between 6 and 6.5. Anything higher than 6.5 is diabetes. Anything less than 6 is good. That's normal. You want to have your A1C numbers less than 6, right? So what does that mean? If you have 6.4 or 6.1 or 6.2, that doesn't mean you're healthy. That means you have pre-diabetes. Okay, like that's one thing I wanna make clear. Um, if your number used to be 10, if your A1C used to be 10 and now it's an eight, doesn't mean you're healthy. That means you're just less unhealthy, okay? Um, so what is one really great way to improve your diabetes, your blood sugar, your A1C numbers? Exercise. Exercise is a great medicine for your blood sugar. Um, if you exercise, you know, for enough amount of time, so that doesn't mean if you exercise for one day and then you're done for the year, you have to exercise, you know, for many, many days for like months and months and months, um, but it can make your insulin work better. So the insulin, sensitive, insulin sensitivity increases when you exercise and strength train. And what does that do? Um, 
Well, diabetes is when your insulin is not working properly. So if exercise makes your insulin work better, your diabetes is going to improve. So insulin helps to take the, um, the sugar that's in your blood. It takes it and helps to transport it to your muscles, to your organs, so it can be used, right? So that's what insulin does. Exercise helps insulin do a better job. Um, and also exercise helps you lose weight and helps you manage your weight. And I don't know exactly the numbers, but if you lose 10% of your body weight, that has like a significant impact in your insulin sensitivity. So it makes your insulin work better just by losing weight and by getting stronger, your insulin works better. So it has a two times effect um, for your diabetes and your blood sugar. Um, almost done. Um, but this is a part that, especially right now as a physical therapist, I, I see a lot of. Um, and exercise can, you know, just simply just save your life. Um, one of the, one of the leading causes of death and mortality in elderly people is falling and fracturing their hip. Um, this is something that, you know, my, my grandmother, like many years ago, you know, when I was still in junior high school and I was, I think like 11, 12 years old, she fell, she fractured her hip and then it was all downhill from there. And even now, like, you know, when I work in patients' homes and I see them, um, a lot of these elderly people, you know, they're doing well, they're active, they're walking around, they're cooking, they're going to the grocery store, um, and then they fall and then they become bed bound and then they're not able to get out of their bed or even sitting on a chair sometimes is hard for people. This is how a lot of people die, um, especially in the older population. But exercise and strength training is number one, if you've fallen and fractured your hip, it's the only thing that's going to help you walk again. If you get stronger, um, that's the only thing that's going to give your body the support and the strength to continue walking again. But even more importantly than that is if you exercise early enough, then you'll be stronger. Your balance will be better. So maybe you don't fall and fracture yourself in the first place. Or if you exercise, you know, since you were like, you know, much younger, your bone density is going to be stronger. So if you fall, you don't fracture anything. You just get a little bit of a bruise. And then, you know, in four or five days later, you're back, back to your normal routine. So exercise can help to prevent these fractures from happening. But if you do get a fracture, it's the only thing that's going to help you walk again. Um, it's the only thing that's going to help you get out of your bed and return to a normal life. Um, and specifically in you know the orthopedic world, so anything dealing with joints and bones and muscles, um, the number one predictor to see if people recover or rehabilitate better is strength. So it doesn't matter how flexible you are. It doesn't matter how good your doctor or your therapist is. It doesn't matter. It matters on how strong you work. If you were stronger before your injury, then the chance of you recovering after your injury is much, much, much higher. And that's the only proven thing to help to reduce the risk of um, disability in the future. So these are all of the crazy, awesome benefits of strength training. Um, so I want you to feel it. I want you to experience it. Nothing, nothing that we're doing should hurt. Nothing that we're doing should feel uncomfortable. Um, this is just to really get an introduction to the feeling of exercise. It should feel hard. It should feel like you're breathing heavier. It should feel like you're getting tired. Um, it should feel like you're getting sweaty. This is what exercise should feel like. So I'm going to use these dumbbells. So if you have dumbbells, you can use them. If you have cans of beans, you can use them. If you have water bottles, you can use them, whatever you have. Okay. So the first exercise that, um, I'm gonna show you guys is gonna be a squat, okay? So basically you're gonna have your legs a little bit wider, arm like with your weights right in the middle of your legs, and you're gonna bend down, and then you're gonna go up. So once you get that, so go down and up. So when you're strength training, it should be heavy enough that if you do six or seven repetitions, you already start to feel a little tired. You should feel your heart rate increasing. I'm talking to you right now and you can hear my voice. It's changing a little bit. I'm getting a little short of breath. Um, and you should be able to do at least 10 to 12 repetitions without any problems if you're strength training. If it's heavier than that, that could put a little bit more stress on your joints and your muscles but that's something more advanced. Okay. Yeah. Great. 
So from the side, it looks like this. So you're going to bend down and go up. So from the front, it looks like this. So this is just one exercise that if you're strength training, you should do at least 10 to 12 repetitions. Whew. And um, <laughs> you should do at least 10 to 12 repetitions and you should do three to four sets, meaning you do 10 to 12 and you take a short break. Then you do 10 to 12, take a short break. 10 to 12 again, take a short break. And then 10 to 12 again and take a short break. So that's how much you need to do to get your muscles and your muscles stronger and everything to get the benefit. If you do any kind of exercise just 10 times and then you move on to the next exercise, you really won't get stronger. All right, so let's do it again. The same exercise. If you don't have any weights, even if you do this without weights, in the beginning, it's gonna give you good exercise. But then, you can, do as, you can do as heavy as you can handle. So, if you can do five pounds, do five pounds. If you can do three pounds, you can do three pounds. If you can do 100 pounds, you can do 100 pounds. It's all good for you, it's based on what you can handle. So your dose of this medicine depends on your body. So take a break. Who here feels like their heart is beating a little faster? So I feel like my heart is coming up a little bit. So this is how you know your heart is getting good exercise. Um, I like to measure my, I like to measure my heart rate once in a while while I'm exercising, just so I can see how fast it's beating. Um, if you're strength training and working on exercise, you want your heart rate to increase. Meaning, if you're at rest at like 60 to 70 beats per minute at rest. When you're exercising, it should go to like 100 to 115. It should increase to a pretty high level. So right now my heart rate is at 119 beats. So let's do it again. If your heart rate is not increasing that much, that means you're not exercising intensely enough. Or it could mean that you have a pacemaker, you have some medication that is limiting how high your heart rate, can, heart rate can go. And in that situation, you should definitely talk to a physical therapist so they can make sure you're exercising in a safe range for your heart. So I lost count. Okay. So that was three sets. We did about 10 to 12 repetitions. I am a little tired. It's early in the morning for me, so I'm not used to this right now. Uh, but I'm gonna show you another exercise that I like to do. Whew. All right, so for this, you can use the same weights again. Uh, this time you're gonna hold it down like this in front of you. And you're gonna bend down and then you're gonna pull up and then stand up. So you're going to bend down and then pull the weights up. So bend down, pull up. So if you have any kind of hip pain or back pain, this might feel a little uncomfortable, but this is going to make your, the back of your legs really strong and your lower back really strong. And when you're pulling up like this, it's going to make your arm muscles here strong. It's going to make the back of your shoulder strong. So it's going to help your posture stand a little bit straighter. So same thing. You're going to do this exercise 10 to 12 times for three, rep, uh, for three sets. So this exercise, it's a little bit less intense for me. Meaning if I can, I can do this exercise with a little bit heavier weight and get the same benefit of the first exercise. Okay. So that was 10, so I'm gonna take a little bit of a break. And that's the important thing when you're doing strength training, um, especially when you're doing moderate or like moderate like intensity exercise. Um, you need to do the exercise, make it challenging, give your body time to recover a little bit. 
do the exercise, challenge your body, then let it recover a little bit. So this is different than if you're doing aerobic exercise or if you're doing like treadmill or walking or bicycling or running. You're running the whole time and that's good to keep your heart rate at a high level the whole time. So that's one type of exercise. This exercise that I'm showing you right now is more strength training, it's more moderate level. So it goes up, you give it time to recover, it goes up, give it time to recover, goes up and give it time to recover. So it's a little bit different. So again, let's do another 10 to 12. And then I'm gonna show you another exercise after this. So what I love about what I do with work, I like to see what people have at home and use their equipment to help come up with an exercise. So I've, I've had people do this with a bag of potatoes. They, they'll, hold, they'll hold a bag of potatoes like this and they'll do the same thing. So I'll use whatever you have at home. With some kids, I'll have them use like a backpack and then they'll, you know, they'll go down with their backpack and pull. So I'll use anything like that. I'll use textbooks. Um, anything like that that you can think of. All right. So I want to show you one more exercise. I'm a little tired. Good. So this is like just another exercise that I like doing for myself because I have some knee issues. I have some lower back issues. So I can use like these elastic bands also to get a really good exercise. So I'm going to stand on the elastic, elastic band. You can also put it around your ankles. You can also put it around your knees. You just kind of get into like a little bend and walk sideways. If you don't have the elastic bands, you can also put your hands on your legs and kind of push in while your legs are pushing out. So already I feel like a really good exercise right here in the back of my legs. All right, so you do a couple of these, take a break when you feel really tired. I'm already a little tired today. That means I need to exercise more because I'm a little out of shape, but that's okay. This is exercising my brain and my heart anyways, and that's the important thing. And do a little bit more of this and then we'll have time for questions and answers. So just start thinking of what questions you want to ask, okay? So I'm a little sweaty right now. How many of you guys are getting a little sweaty already? So I'm sweating a little bit. My heart rate went up to like 119 before. It's at like 99 right now. Um, this is how it should feel when you're exercising. This is how it should feel when you're strength training. You should feel sweaty. You should feel like your heart is beating faster. It should feel like it's hard to talk. Um, these are all good things. Whew. Good. There you go. That's, that's, that's how it should feel. So when somebody tells you, you know, if you're walking for 30 minutes and that's exercise, for some people it might be exercise, but not for everybody. If I walk for 30 minutes, my heart rate is not gonna to go to like 99 or 100, it's gonna stay maybe like 85. So for me, walking is not exercise, walking is walking. Walking is very important for many things, but it's not gonna solve everything. So for me, and for a lot of people, you need to do other exercises in addition to walking just to get the benefit for your brain, your heart, your kidneys, your bones, there's other things you also need to do, all right? All right, I need a sip of water. So if anybody has any questions right now, just feel free to ask and um, yeah, let's, let's talk. Um, that's a great question. So when a lot of people exercise and they haven't exercised for a while, your muscles feel really sore. Um, I, 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 think that, I think that is a side effect, but that's typically meaning that you did it in the right places. So for example, 
let, let's say I exercise today and I haven't exercised before, maybe by the day after tomorrow, I'm gonna get a little bit of soreness in my arms, maybe a little bit of soreness in my thigh, maybe a little bit of soreness in my butt. Um, that's a good thing because you like it's better to feel soreness in the muscles rather than feeling pain in the joints. So if I'm exercising and I feel pain here, that's not good. But if I feel soreness back here, if I feel soreness up here, that's still a good thing. So I, I wouldn't, yeah, maybe it's a side effect, but it's more like a, um, it's more like proof that it's working. And over time, the stronger you become and the more you exercise, you're not going to get sore anymore. So what I mean by that is, you know, I'm a pretty active guy, but then there's some times where I've been injured or there's some times where I'm really busy at work and I haven't exercised in a month. Um, and if I start exercising again, I'm also going to get the soreness for the first two or three times I exercise. But then the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth time, I don't have any more soreness. And that's the common thing for anybody. So don't be scared of the soreness. Don't be scared of the delayed onset. Like if you're waiting two days and you feel, um, you know, some soreness in your muscles, that's not a bad thing. Just talk to somebody just so make, they, we can make sure. So one thing I always ask my patients is where do you feel the soreness? Does it feel sore in this area or this area? Does it feel more sore when you're sitting or standing um, or bending? Like when do you feel it the most? And all of these things help me figure out if it's the good soreness um, and that just means my patient needs to exercise a little bit more to get stronger or is the bad soreness where we need to change how we're exercising. Yeah. Um, great question. And I think you know, this is important, not just for COVID, but in, in addition to other breathing, like any disorders that involve breathing, like COPD, asthma, lung cancer, all of these things do impact how you can exercise and it can change how, how you need to exercise. So for, for me, I, I had COVID in January and luckily for me it wasn't really severe i didn't have any kind of breathing problems but i i did have like some soreness in my back i had a lot of aches and i was really tired for like a week and a half um so i didn't have any breathing problems but one thing that they did find was if you change your positions and if you like do a little bit of exercise um it did help improve the symptoms of covid and it did help to increase your oxygen levels in your blood um, so like walking, changing positions, doing a little bit of stretching, um, all of these things help your breathing because, you know, your lungs are around your, they're in your rib cage and your rib cage is surrounded by joints. There's a lot of joints in your back, your thoracic spine. There's all of these muscles in your core, muscles in your chest, muscles around your neck. All of these muscles help or hurt how you can breathe. So what I mean by that is if you have really weak muscles around your chest and your core, they're not gonna expand and they're not gonna contract. And you need to contract to blow air out of your mouth. You need to expand and stretch for the air to come into your mouth. So all of these things can improve through exercise, but as a physical therapist, if I have a patient with any kind of lung issue, including COVID, I need to monitor them. So I, when they're exercising, I need to look at their oxygen levels. I need to look at their heart rate. Um, I need to look at how they're talking to me. Are they looking, are they looking pale? Do they look more tired? Uh, all of these things are something that I keep in mind while we're exercising together and I want to see it improve over time. Yeah. Mm hmm. Great question. Great question. Um, and I'll tell you for many reasons why that was a really good question. So everybody talks about osteoporosis, right? Everybody knows what osteoporosis is, but there's another thing also like, so the, the muscle equivalent of osteoporosis is called sarcopenia. Sarco meaning muscle. And that's a really common thing as, as you get older, your muscle density also decreases too. Your muscle mass decreases. So it's a very important thing that we need to like keep in mind as we're getting older. 
And it's like, I think like right after like 26, 27, 28, depending on, you know, genetic factors, your, your other, other factors, like your, your muscle density and your muscle mass is at a high level at that time if you're exercising and then it slows down and then it starts coming downward. Um, so yes, diet is very important, especially for vegetarian people that really influences if you can maintain your, your body, your muscle mass, right? If you're not eating enough protein, then your muscle mass is going to go down a little bit faster, but diet can only really maintain muscle mass. There's nothing that can increase your muscle mass besides exercise. So if you're very flexible, that's an amazing thing. And that's something that, you know, a lot of people, um, don't have the flexibility in their muscles, but flexibility is not muscle mass. So like you need to also do exercises to get your muscles stronger and then that's going to help improve your muscle density and your muscle mass, not just stretching and not just yoga. So as a, as a physical therapist, I actually see a lot of patients who get hurt doing yoga because they do too many stretches and they don't do enough exercises to make their muscles stronger. Um, and exercise plus diet is the only way to increase your bone, um, not your bone, sorry, it's the only way to increase your muscle mass and your um, muscle density. So you need to exercise and you need to eat. If you do one or the other, if you don't eat properly, it doesn't matter how much you're exercising, you're not, you're not going to get better if you're not eating properly. Um, and same thing, if you're not eating, if you're eating properly, but you're not exercising properly, yeah, you can maintain, you can stay pretty healthy for some time, but you're never going to improve. You're never going to recover. You're not going to get better from here. Um, but also like not just eating and eating and, um, exercise, you also need to sleep properly. Like sleeping is very important to help your body rebuild muscle, to rebuild everything. Um, I think those are the three main things that all need to happen for muscle density to improve and increase. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. The hard part for that as you know, like in the medical field as a scientist, um, as somebody that reads a lot of research, it's hard to get data on quality, but it's easy to get data on quantity, right? Because um, for me to do a study, it's easier for me to study how much somebody can sleep because that's an objective number. If somebody slept for six hours, seven hours, eight hours, nine hours, that's easy for me to track. But quality, the quality of sleep, that's very hard for me to study. So for example, they did a lot of this research on athletes um, and they compared injury rates with people who slept six hours a night, seven hours a night, eight hours a night, or nine hours a night. And they found that people that had the least number of injuries slept the most. So they had nine hours of sleep or eight hours of sleep and they had a less chance of getting injured versus if they had six hours of sleep or seven hours of sleep. So that was, that's an easy study to, to compare and keep track, but the quality of sleep, that's much harder to study. So, um, you know, I, I don't have a good answer for the quality, but definitely quantity matters. Just, just, you know, just intuitively, it seems like quality of sleep makes a difference also. Like if you can sleep really nicely for four or five hours, that's still better than sleeping poorly for, you know, six or seven hours. But if you compare eight hours of sleep to like five hours of good sleep, I don't know which is better. Mm -hmm. How long has that been happening for? Okay. Did anything else happen in your life two years ago? Like any new medicine or any um, new like lifestyle? Did you do anything different two years ago? Anything start? Um, so those are the kind of things that matter because cramping is such a hard thing to um, pinpoint. Uh, there really isn't one cause of cramping. Um, they, you know, a lot of times people think that you could be dehydrated or you could have low level of electrolytes, and it could be. Um, but a lot of people get cramping even if they have, if they're fully hydrated, even if they're, you know, drinking Gatorade and they have electrolytes in their system. People still cramp sometimes. So cramping can be caused by many different things. Um, some of it could be nutrition related. Some of it could be a neurological cramping because your muscles contract only based on how your nerve and your spinal cord tells it to. So sometimes there could be, um, some neurological reason for this cramping to occur. Um, 
like for example like a seizure is like a whole body is like convulsion like cramp kind of almost if you would say and that's like a neurological thing so not to scare you that's not what i'm saying i'm saying that um cramping can be caused by so many different things it's really hard to pinpoint but if you've been happy having cramping for two years regularly um what i would try doing first is exercising and stretching that muscle that you're cramping and then after two to three weeks see if it feels like it's cramping less and for most people it does improve even though we don't know why sometimes it does improve so if your leg is cramping down here in your calf muscle, like if it's cramping here, this is a common place where people have cramping. People sometimes get cramping back here. So yeah, so what I would do is just do a few exercises and stretches for those muscles. And then after two to three weeks, you should feel like if there's a benefit or not. So it's it's that it's that quick and it's that simple of a of a fix. So if you need help on learning how to exercise or stretch. That's the perfect time to see a physical therapist because this is like a minor thing right now. And the, the faster you fix a minor thing, um, the quicker you can fix it and not turn it into a big thing. So that's what I really try to like work on with people. If you have like a small little ache, small little like discomfort, small little pain, fix it. Let's find out why it's happening. Let's correct it. Let's get you stronger and more flexible so then it doesn't turn into a big injury or a big disability.